six, 11, 16, 14, 21. Marley was dead to begin with. This must be distinctly understood or nothing wonderful can come of the story I'm going to relate. Scrooge knew he was dead. <laughs> of course he did. How could it be otherwise? The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk and Scrooge. Scrooge was his sole executor, his sole administrator, his sole assign, his sole residuary legatee, his sole friend and his sole mourner. Now, Marley was dead as a doornail. Scrooge and Marley were partners for, I don't know how many years. Scrooge was a squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner hard and sharp as flint. Nobody ever stopped Scrooge in the streets with gladsome looks to say, my dear Scrooge, how are you? When will you come and see us? No beggars implored him to bestow a trifle. No children asked him what it was o'clock. Even the blind men's dogs, when they saw him coming on, would tug their owners into doorways and up courtyards. But what did Scrooge care? It was the very thing he liked, to edge his way along the crowded path of life, warning all human sympathy to keep its distance. Once upon a time, of all the good days in the year, upon a Christmas Eve, Old Scrooge sat busy in his premises. The door of Scrooge's office was open that he might keep his eye upon his clerk, Bob Cratchit, who in a dismal little cell beyond a sort of tank was copying letters. Now Scrooge had a very small fire, but his clerk's fire was so very much smaller that it looked like one coal. Wherefore, he tried to warm himself at the candle. In which effort, not being a man of strong imagination, he failed. <laughs> a Merry Christmas, Uncle! God save you! It was the voice of Fred Hollywell, Scrooge's nephew, who came upon him so suddenly, this was the first intimation Scrooge had of his approach. Merry Christmas. What's Christmas time to you? But a time for paying bills with no money, a time for finding yourself a year older and not an hour richer. If I could work my will, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips would be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a steak of holly through his heart. He should. <sighs> there are many things from which I might have derived good, Uncle, from which I have not profited, I dare say. Christmas among the rest, but I have always thought of Christmas as a good time, a kind, forgiving, charitable time, and I say, God bless it. <sighs> Humbug. Don't be angry, Uncle. Come dine with us tomorrow. Dine with you. I'd rather see you in hell first. But why? Why? Why did you get married? Because I fell in love. Because you fell in love. A foolhardy career move. <sighs> Uncle, why cannot we be friends? Good afternoon. 
I am sorry with all my heart to find you so resolute. We have never had a quarrel to which I have been a party, but I have made the trial in homage to Christmas, and I will keep my Christmas humor to the last. And so I say, Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon. And a Happy New Year. Good afternoon. You're letting Scrooge's nephew out. His clerk had let two other people in. They were portly gentlemen who now stood before Scrooge with their hats off. <coughs> uh, Scrooge and Marley's, I believe. <laughs> um, have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley's been dead these seven years. He died seven years ago this very night. Oh, well, uh, at this festive time of the year, Mr. Scrooge, it is usually more than desirable that we make some slight provision for the poor and destitute who suffer greatly at the present time. Many thousands are in want of common necessaries. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comforts, sir. Are there no prisons? The union workhouses, the treadmill, are they still in operation? <laughs> yes, sir, they are. Oh, good. I thought from what you were saying that something must have happened to stop them in their useful operation. <laughs> yes, but uh, they scarcely provide Christian <laughs> cheer of mind or body to the unoffending multitudes, Mr. Scrooge. Uh, now, uh, what should I put you down for? Nothing. Uh, you wish to be anonymous. I wish to be left alone, gentlemen, uh, since you ask me what I wish. Look, I, I help to support the prisons the workhouses, uh, the treadmill, and so forth, uh, they cost me enough. Those who are badly off must go there. Many cannot go there, Mr. Scrooge, and many would rather die. Then if they would rather die, they'd better do it and decrease the surplus population. Now, I bid you good day, gentlemen. At length, the hour for shutting up the counting house arrived. With an ill will, Scrooge reluctantly acknowledged the fact to the expectant clerk, who instantly snuffed his candle out and put his hat on. You'll be wanting the whole day tomorrow, I suppose. If quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient. And it's not fair. If I were to stop half a crown for it, you'd think yourself mightily ill-used, I'll be bound. <sighs> yes, sir. Mm. And yet, you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wage for no work. It's only once a year, sir. Uh, a poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. But I suppose you must have the whole day. Be here all the earlier the next morning. The clerk promised that he would, and Scrooge walked out with a growl. Fifteen shillings a week, a wife and family, and he talks of a Merry Christmas. I'll retire to Bedlam. Now it is a fact 
that there was nothing at all particular about the knocker on the door of Scrooge's house, except that it was very large, and also that Scrooge had as little of what is called fancy about him as any man in the city of London. Yet Scrooge, having his key in the lock of the door, saw in the knocker, without its undergoing any intermediary process of change, not a knocker, but Marley's face. Marley's face. As he looked fixedly at the phenomenon. It was a knocker again. Scrooge said, Bah! and closed the door with a bang. Scrooge closed his bedchamber door and locked himself in, double locked himself in, which was not his custom. Thus secure against surprise, he took off his coat and put on his dressing gown and sat before the very low fire to take his gruel. Throwing his head back in the chair, Scrooge's glance happened to rest upon a bell that hung in the room and communicated for some purpose now forgotten with a chamber in the highest story of the building. It was with great astonishment and strange, inexplicable dread that as he looked at it, the bell began to swing. Soon it rang out loudly. So did every other bell in the house. This was succeeded by a strange clanking noise deep down below. As if some person were dragging a heavy chain. The noise grew louder. Coming up up, up the stairs. It came straight towards Scrooge's bedchamber door, then came on through the heavy door. And the spectre stood in the room before his very eyes. It was covered in chains that were drawn around him and hung round like a Tail. Above the chains were heavy cash boxes, ledgers, deeds, padlocks, keys, and heavy purses, all wrought in steel. Oh, mercy. Dreadful apparition. Who are you? Ask me who I was. Who were you then? <laughs> In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. What do you want from me? Much. It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men. And if that spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. 
doomed to wander the world witnessing what it might have shared but cannot share in terms of happiness. I wear the chains I forged in life. I made them link by link. And yard by yard, I made them, Ebenezer. Do you know the heavy chain you bear yourself? It was as full and long and heavy as this seven Christmas Eves ago. And <laughs> it is a ponderous chain. I am here tonight to warn you that you yet have a chance and hope of escaping my fate. The chance and hope of my procuring Ebenezer. You were always a good friend to me, Jacob. You will be visited by three spirits. Is that the chance and hope you mentioned, Jacob? I think I'd rather not. No, 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 no. Without their visits, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Jacob, speak comfort to me. I have none to give. Expect the first tomorrow night when the bell tolls one and look to see me no more and look that you remember what has passed between us. The church clock Told a deep, dull, hollow, melancholy one. The curtains round Scrooge's bed were drawn by a strange figure, like a child, yet not so like a child, it's like an old man. The hair that hung about its neck and down its back was white as if with age. Yet the face had not a wrinkle in it. Are you the spirit, sir, whose coming was foretold to me? I am. Who and what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past? No, your past. My past? Yes, your past. The things you will see with me are but shadows of the things that have been. They will have no consciousness of us. Now rise and walk with me. As the words were spoken, they passed through the wall and stood in the busy thoroughfares of the city. It was made plain enough by the dressing of the shops that here too it was Christmas time. The spirit stopped beside a certain warehouse door and asked Scrooge if he knew it. know it. I was apprenticed here. 
Why, it's old Fezziwig. <laughs> old Fezziwig, bless his heart. Fezziwig alive again. Uh, old Fezziwig laid down his pen and looked up at the clock which pointed to the hour of seven. Then he called out in a comfortable, oily, rich, fat, jovial voice. <laughs> Yo-ho there! Yo-ho, my boys! Dick Ebenezer! Christmas Eve, Dick! Christmas Ebenezer! Put up the shutters before a man can say Jack Robinson! No more work tonight! And then there were dances and forfeits and there was a great piece of cold roast and a great piece of cold boiled. There was negus, mince pies, cake, and plenty of beer. But the great effect of the evening came when the fiddler struck up Sir Roger de Coverley and old Fezziwig danced with Mrs. Fezziwig. Advance and retire. Turn your partner. Bow and curtsy. Fezziwig cut, cut so deftly that he appeared to wink with his legs. When the clock struck eleven, this domestic ball ended, and everyone left, thanking the Fezziwigs again, <laughs> again, and again. <laughs> <laughs> a small matter, said the spirit, that these silly folks should feel such gratitude. He has spent but a few pounds of your mortal money. Is that so much that he deserves this praise? It isn't that spirit. He has the power to make us happy or unhappy, to render our service light or burdensome. The happiness he gives is worth quite as much as if it cost a fortune. Scrooge felt the spirit's glance and stopped. My time grows short. This was not addressed to Scrooge, nor to anyone whom he could see, but it had an immediate effect. For again he saw himself, he was older now, a man in the prime of life. And he sat by the side of a fair young girl in a black dress in whose eyes there were tears. It matters little to you. It matters very little. Another idol has displaced me. A golden one. Gain engrosses you, Ebenezer. And so, I release you with a full heart for the love of him you once were. Spirit, Remove me from this place. Take me back. I told you these are but shadows of the things that have been. I cannot bear it. Remove me. Haunt me no more. Leave me. Haunt me no more. Haunt me no more. No more. No more. <laughs> Scrooge was conscious in his struggle with the spirit of being exhausted and overcome by an irresistible drowsiness. He had barely time to reel to bed before he sank into a heavy sleep.
Scrooge awoke in his own bedroom. It and his own adjoining sitting room, into which he shuffled in his slippers, had undergone a surprising transformation. Walls and ceiling were so hung with living green, mistletoe and holly <laughs> that it looked a perfect grove and such a mighty blaze went roaring up the chimney as the hearth had never known in Scrooge's time. Upon the floor were heaped to form a kind of throne. Turkeys, geese, ducklings, Long wreaths of sausages, barrels of oysters, joints of meat, suckling pigs, plum puddings, rosy-cheeked apples, juicy oranges, and steaming, steaming bowls of punch. In easy state upon this couch sat a giant, glorious to see, who bore a torch not unlike Plenty's horn, and he held it high to cast its light on Scrooge as he came peeping round the door. <laughs> come in! Come in! And know me better, man! Look upon me! I am the ghost of Christmas present! You have never seen the like of me before. I, I don't think I have. Ghost of the present. I went forth last night on compulsion and I learned a lesson which is working now. Tonight, if you have aught to teach me, let me profit by it. Touch my robe. Scrooge did as he was told and held it fast, and together he and the spirit passed on invisible straight to Scrooge's clerk's house. And in came little Bob with at least three feet of comforter hanging down before him, exclusive of the fringe, and tiny Tim upon his shoulder who bore a little crutch and had his legs supported by an iron frame. And how did little Tim behave today? Asked Mrs. Cratchit. <laughs> as good as gold and better. Somehow he gets thoughtful sitting by himself so much and he says the strangest things. Coming home, he told me, that he hoped the people in the church saw him, for it might be pleasant to them upon Christmas Day to remember who made the lame to walk and blind men see. <laughs> then Bob proposed a toast to the whole family. A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us. God bless us, everyone, said Tiny Tim, the last of all. Scrooge asked the spirit if Tiny Tim would live. I see a vacant seat in the poor chimney corner and a crutch without an owner. If these shadows are not altered by the future, the child will die. No, spirit. Say it is not so. If he be like to die, he'd better do it and decrease the surplus population. Oh, man. If man in heart you be, forbear that wicked cant until you know what the surplus is and who it is for in the eyes of heaven, it well may be that you are seen as less fit to live than millions 
like the child of this poor man. Mr. Scrooge, Scrooge raised his head speedily upon hearing his own name. I give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. Founder of the feast indeed. I'd like to have him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast upon. And I hope he'd have an appetite for it, said Mrs. Cratchit. My dear, Christmas Day, children. It should be Christmas Day on which we drink the health of such an odious, hard, stingy, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. Oh, you know he is, Robert. You, of all people, poor fellow. My dear, was Bob's soft reply. Christmas Day. I'll drink his health for your sake in the days, but not for his. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Long life to him. He'll be very merry and very happy, I have no doubt. It was a great surprise to Scrooge as this scene vanished to hear a hearty laugh. And an even greater surprise to recognize it as that of his own nephew, Fred, and to find himself in a bright, dry, gleaming room with the spirit standing by his side, smiling at that same nephew with approving affability. <laughs> and he said, Christmas is a humbug. <laughs> Upon my life. Then he takes it into his head to dislike us and he won't come and dine with us. What's the consequence? He doesn't lose much of a dinner. Indeed, said Scrooge's niece. I think he loses a very good dinner. And everybody had to agree. It must be allowed that they were competent judges as they had just ate dinner. What do you say, Topper? Topper, who clearly had his eye on one of Scrooge's niece's sisters, said, oh, 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 well, uh, a bachelor is a wretched outcast. <laughs> Does not deserve to have an opinion on the subject. Whereat Scrooge's niece's sister, the plump one in the lace tucker, blushed. Suddenly, as they stood together in an open place, the bell struck midnight. Scrooge looked about him for the spirit, but saw it no more. Remembering the prediction of old Jacob Marley, and lifting up his eyes, Scrooge beheld a solemn phantom coming like a mist along the ground towards him. The phantom slowly, gravely, silently approached. When it came near him, Scrooge bent down upon his knee, for in the air through which this spirit moved, it seemed to scatter gloom and mystery. It was shrouded in a deep black garment which concealed its head, its face, its form, and left nothing of it visible save one outstretched hand. He knew no more, for the spirit neither spoke nor moved. I am in the presence of the ghost of Christmas yet to come. Ghost of the future, I fear you more than any spectre I have seen. But, but as I know your purpose is to do me good, I am prepared to bear you company and do it with a thankful heart. Will you not speak to me? It gave him no reply. 
The hand was pointed straight before them. Lead on. Lead on, spirits. The night is waning fast, and it is precious time to me, I know. Lead on! They scarcely seemed to enter the city, for the city rather seemed to spring up about them, but there they were, in the heart of it, on the exchange amongst the merchants. The spirits stopped beside one little knot of businessmen. Observing that the hand was pointed to them, Scrooge advanced to listen to their talk. No, I don't know much about it either way, said a portly man with a large chin. When did he die? inquired another. Last night, I believe. Why? What was the matter with him? I thought he'd never die. God knows, said the first with a yawn. <laughs> so, old Scratch has finally got his own at last, eh? What's he done with all his money? I haven't heard. Company, perhaps. <laughs> he hasn't left it to me, that's all I know. <laughs> Scrooge was inclined to be surprised that the spirit should attach importance to conversation apparently so trivial. But feeling that it must have some hidden purpose, he set himself to consider what it was likely to be. It could scarcely be supposed to have any bearing on the death of Jacob, for that was past. This ghost's province was the future. He looked about in that very place for his own image. But another man stood in his accustomed corner, and though the clock pointed to his usual time of day for being there, he saw no likeness of himself among the multitudes that poured in through the porch gave him little surprise, however, for he had been revolving in his mind a change of life. And he thought, he hoped, he saw his newborn resolutions carried out in this. Spirit, I see the case of this unhappy man might be my own. My life tends that way now. Oh, oh, merciful heavens, what is this? What is this? The scene had changed. Now he almost touched a bare, uncurtained bed. And on that bed, unwept, uncared for, unloved, lay the body of this plundered man, unknown, with covered face. Oh. Oh. oh, Spirit, this is a fearful place. Spirit, show me some tenderness connected with a death spirit, or, or this dark chamber will be forever present to me. The ghost of Christmas yet to come conducted him to poor Bob Cratchit's house, the dwelling he had visited before, and found the mother and the children sitting round the fire. Quiet, very quiet. The noisy little Cratchits were as still as statues and sat in one corner, looking up at Peter, who had a book before him. The mother and her daughters were engaged in needlework, but surely they were very quiet. And he took a child and set him in the midst of them. Where had Scrooge heard those words? He had not dreamed them. The boy must have read them out as he and the spirit crossed the threshold, but why did he not go on? The mother laid her work upon the table and put her hand up to her face. <laughs> 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 
the colour hurts my eyes. The colour? Ah, oh, poor tiny Tim. The, the better now again. <laughs> it makes him weak by candlelight, and I wouldn't show weak eyes to your father when he comes home for the world. It must be near his time. Past it, rather, said Peter, shutting up his book. But I think he, he, he's walked a little slower than he used these past few evenings, Mother. Yes. Yes, I suppose. Oh, there's your father at the door. She hurried out to meet him, and in came little Bob in his comforter. He had need of it, poor fellow. His tea was ready for him on the hob, and they all tried who should help him to it most. The two younger Cratchits got upon his knees and laid each child a little cheek against his face, as if to say, don't mind it, Father. Don't be grieved. Bob was very cheerful with them and spoke pleasantly to the whole family. He looked at the work upon the table and praised the industry and speed of Mrs. Cratchit and the girls. He said they would be done long before Sunday. Sunday? You went today then, Robert? Yes. Yes, my dear, I went. I wish you could have gone. It would have done you good to see how green a place it is. But you'll see it often. I promised him that we would walk there on a Sunday. My little child. <laughs> My little child. <laughs> the ghost of Christmas yet to come conveyed him to a dismal, wretched, ruinous churchyard. The spirit stood among the graves and pointed down to one. Before I draw nearer to that stone to which you point, answer me one question. One. Are these the shadows of the things that will be, or are they shadows of the things that may be only? Still, the spirit pointed downward to the grave by which it stood. Men's courses will foreshadow certain ends. To which you persevered in, they must lead. But if the courses be departed from, the ends must change. Say it is thus with what you show me. The spirit was immovable as ever. Scrooge crept towards it, trembling as he went, and following the finger, read upon the stone of the neglected grave his own name. And then he's screwed. <laughs> no, no, spirit, no. Please hear me. I am not the man I was. I will not be the man I must have been but for this intercourse. Why show me this if I am past all hope? Tell me that I yet may change the shadows of the things you have shown me by an altered life. <laughs> for the first time, the hand faltered. I, I will honor Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all through the year. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. Oh, tell me I may sponge away the writing on this stone. <laughs> Holding up his hands, in one final prayer to have his fate reverse, 
Scrooge saw an alteration in the spirit's hood and dress. It shrunk, collapsed, and dwindled down into a bedpost. Yes, and the bedpost was his own. The bed was his own, the room was his own. Best and happiest of all, the time before him was his own to make amends in. Scrooge was so happy, he became giddy as a schoolboy. checked in his transports by the church bells ringing out the lustiest peals he had ever heard. Rushing to the window, he opened it and put out his head. No mist, no fog, no night. Clear, bright, stirring, golden day. Boy, boy! cried Scrooge, calling downward to a boy in Sunday clothes who perhaps had loitered in to look about him. Eh? Uh, what's today? Today? Why, it's Christmas Day. It's Christmas Day. I haven't missed it. Spirits have done it all in one night. They can do anything they like. Of course they can. Hello, my fine fellow. Hello. Uh, do you know the poulterers in the next street but one? I should hope I did. <laughs> Intelligent boy, a remarkable boy. <laughs> Do you know whether they've sold the prize turkey that was hanging up there? Not the little prize turkey, the big one. What, well, one's as big as me? <laughs> Delightful boy, it's a pleasure to talk to him. Yes, my boy. It's hanging there now. It is, go and buy it. Walker! No, no, I, I'm in earnest. <laughs> Come back. Go and buy it and tell him to bring it here that I may give them the direction where to take it. Come back with the man and I'll give you a shilling. Come back with him in less than five minutes and I'll give you a half a crown. <laughs> the boy was off like a shot. I'll send it to Bob Cratchit's. He shan't know who sends it. It's twice the size of Tiny Tim. Joe Miller never made such a joke as sending it to Bob's will be. The hand in which he wrote the address was not a steady one, but write it he did somehow. And at last went downstairs to open the street door ready for the coming of the poulterer's men. was a turkey. He never could have stood upon his legs, that bird. He would have snapped them off short in a minute like sticks of sealing wax. Scrooge dressed himself, all in his best, and at last got out into the streets, where by this time the people were pouring forth, just as he had seen them with the ghosts of Christmas present. And walking with his hands behind him, Scrooge regarded everyone with a delighted smile. <laughs> he looked so irresistibly pleasant in a word that three or four good-humoured fellows said, good morning, sir, a Merry Christmas to you. And Scrooge said often afterwards that of all the blithe sounds he had ever heard, those were the blithest in his ears. In the afternoon, he turned his steps towards his nephew's house. He passed the door a dozen times before he had the courage to go up and knock, but he made a dash and did it. Is your master at home, my dear? Yes, sir. Where is he, my love? He's in the dining room, sir, along with the mistress. He knows me, said Scrooge, with his hand already on the dining room lock. I'll go in here, my dear.
Fred. I bless my soul. Who's that? It's I, your uncle, Scrooge. I've come to dinner, Fred. Will you let me in? Let him in? It's a mercy he didn't shake his arm off. He was at home in five minutes. Nothing could be heartier. His niece looked just the same. So did Topper when he came. So did the plump sister when she came. So did everyone when they came. Wonderful party. Wonderful games. Wonderful unanimity. Wonderful happiness. But he was early at the office next morning. Oh, he was early there. If he could only be there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming late. That was the thing he had set his heart upon. And he did it. The clock struck nine. No Bob. A quarter past. No Bob. Bob was full 18 minutes and a half behind his time. Bob's hat was off before he opened the door. His comforter too, and he was on his stool in a jiffy, driving away with his pen as if he were trying to overtake nine o'clock. Hello, growled Scrooge in his accustomed voice, or as near as he could feign it. What do you mean by coming here at this time of the day? I am very sorry, sir. I am behind my time. You are? Yes. Yes, I think you are. Step this way, sir, if you please. I am very sorry, Mr. Scrooge. I'm afraid I was making... Rather merry yesterday, sir. It's only once a year, sir. Now, I'll tell you what, my friend. I am not going to stand this sort of thing any longer. And therefore, Scrooge continued, leaping from his stool and giving Bob such a dig in his waistcoat that Bob staggered back into the tank again. And therefore, I am about to... I am about to... <laughs> raise your salary. Bob trembled and got a little nearer to the ruler. A Merry Christmas, Bob, said Scrooge with an earnestness that could not be mistaken. A merrier Christmas, Bob, my good fellow, than I have given you for many a year. I will raise your salary, and I'll endeavor to assist your struggling family. And we'll discuss your affairs this very afternoon over a Christmas bowl of smoking bishop, Bob. <laughs> now, make up the fires and buy a second coal scuttle before you dot another eye, Bob Cratchit. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all and infinitely more. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He became as good a friend, as good a master, as good a man, as the good old city knew, or any other good old city, town, or borough in the good old world. Some people laughed to see the alteration in him, but his own heart laughed. And that was quite enough for him. He had no further intercourse with spirits, but in that respect lived upon the total abstinence principle ever afterwards. And it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well if any man alive possessed the knowledge. May that be truly said of us and all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us. Everyone.